January 1991. An F-15 pilot on combat air patrol sweeps the skies of Iraq. All righty, I'm Gettner Drummond, captain in the 27th Fighter Squadron. Flying F-15s over Iraq. Today has been a, a big sweep. We started from the central, swept up toward Baghdad, hung a right to the east, looked at several airfields in the southeastern and eastern sector, ran the Iranian border, uh, repeated that a couple of times, and then came back to Saudi Arabia to refuel. Now that we have our gas, we'll uh, shortly be headed back up north to do the same thing one more time. Although its political significance is still being debated, the war in the Persian Gulf was a turning point in military history. For the first time, a massive strategic air campaign led to a decisive victory over a well-defended opponent. The first goal of the campaign was to quickly gain control of the skies. For that, no plane was better suited than the F-15 Eagle. First flown in 1972, the F-15 Eagle was a major advance in high-performance fighter aircraft, but it was only developed because the United States thought the Soviet Union had a better plane. For the F-15 was a direct response to the MiG-25 Foxbat, a fast-flying, high-altitude fighter that seemed far superior to the West's top jet, the F-4 Phantom. Years later, Western analysts discovered the Foxbat was not the stellar leap in aviation technology that it seemed to be. But in the 1960s, the threat seemed very real. So the United States Air Force called for manufacturers to design a super fighter, a plane that could outshoot and outfly anything in the sky. McDonnell Douglas won the contract with a two-engine single-seat powerhouse incorporating every cutting-edge electronic system available. The new plane, designated F-15, was big and expensive, about 30 million per plane in today's dollars. But it was the fastest, most maneuverable fighter ever built. It was also the deadliest, for the heart of the F-15 is its APG-70 Pulse Doppler radar, which can locate targets 100 miles away. This is critical, for in air combat, spotting your opponent first can make a life or death difference. When the time to fight arrives, an Eagle pilot has four weapons to choose from. He can fire long-range radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow missiles. He can deploy AIM-9 Sidewinders, deadly close-range weapons that lock onto hot exhaust. AIM-120 missiles, known as AMRAMs, are medium-range weapons similar to but more powerful than AIM-7s. Lastly, the M61 cannon. The F-15 has gone through three major upgrades since it entered Air Force service in 1974. During the Gulf War, American pilots flew the latest fighter model, the F-15C. 120 were sent abroad. They fought alongside 82 Royal Saudi Air Force F-15Ds, essentially the same plane as the C. Saudi F-15s shot down two Iraqi Mirage F-1s during the Gulf War. Over the years, the F-15 has proven itself the dominant air superiority fighter in the world. The design was so successful that the Air Force decided to apply the Eagle's sturdy frame and enormous power to tactical bombing missions. The result was the F-15E, a two-man plane that combines the Eagle's speed and agility with the best bombing system tax dollars can buy. 30% of the Eagle's airframe was modified to enable it to carry heavy bomb loads. The most noticeable changes are the E's longer wingspan and conformal fuel tanks. The E is also painted a darker shade of gray to camouflage its night flying missions. Two squadrons of E's were to become operational in late 1991. But world events rushed the plane into service. The fighter bomber underwent a trial by fire as a key part of the largest coalition air effort since World War II. August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invades Kuwait.
Western and Arab leaders fear that Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein's next target is Saudi Arabia and ultimately control of half the world's oil supply. August 7th, the 71st Squadron of the 1st Tactical Fighter Wing leaves Langley, Virginia. Their destination, Saudi Arabia. I still didn't believe we were going to, uh, to do it until I saw the first uh, Eagle take off from the 71st uh, heading over. And uh, I was number 24 out of the 24 we sent that day. And uh, pretty surreal uh, atmosphere to take off at 5 o'clock uh, in the afternoon uh, from Langley and uh, go out and hit a night tanker. And just the feeling that you were uh, going to go over and do something that uh, we don't normally do uh, nowadays in the military. And the first uh, attack fighter wing hadn't done for uh, quite some time, uh, done a major deployment like that, uh, real world. And uh, I think a lot of us were thinking about that. But uh, the flight over was, it was tense, to tell you the truth, very tense. A 14-hour flight from Langley to Saudi Arabia required each pilot to execute up to eight mid-air refuelings. It was a fitting start to a war in which tankers played a crucial role. Over the six weeks of combat, tankers would pump 110 million gallons of fuel to 46,000 planes. When they arrived at Al-Khaj, American air crews found state-of-the-art airstrips, blast-proof hangars, and modern maintenance facilities waiting for them. Much of this was in place because of a long-standing agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Since 1983, the Saudis have been building emergency airfields across their country for use in case the Gulf was threatened by an aggressor. But despite this advantage, some feared that planes such as the F-15 were simply too complex to survive the pressure of a round-the-clock war. Yeah, there's a piece of safety wire that, uh showed up on the x-ray so we have to in fact just the opposite proved true the number of airplanes ready to fly at any given time actually increased during the war f-15s went from an 85 percent peacetime mission capable rate to a wartime average of 94 percent the hard work of flight crews made it possible for pilots to fly constant defensive counter-air patrols along the border of saudi arabia and iraq the goal was to test Iraq's air defenses and the readiness of Iraqi pilots. Defensive counter-air is basically flying combat air patrols uh, orbits south of the border so that on one leg, the hot leg, you're looking into Iraq to see if they've got anybody taken off to come south to, uh, to do an invasion. And uh, we flew those missions for the five months waiting, about four and a half to six hours at a pop, because any time they'd fly, we'd... Uh, we lock them up. They knew we were up there, and uh, and they were getting uh, that radar spike that told them that the F-15s were looking at them, and if they wanted to try anything, they were welcome to come south. January 17, 1991. In the early hours of the morning, 668 aircraft and their pilots gear up for the first air attack on Iraq and occupied Kuwait. The first night was probably uh, the most impressive because even though they had practiced drills in the Baghdad area where they would turn all the lights out if they, were, if they did get attacked, they didn't when they got attacked. And it was like flying into Philadelphia or someplace uh, totally lit up and you could see the Tigris and the Euphrates as they wound up towards Baghdad. No doubt the first night was uh, fairly impressive. <laughs> the, uh... And what was really unique about that for me was as we let down into our low level and we flew uh, the first 250 miles or so into Iraq at uh, low altitude and, that, and saw absolutely nothing. It was just like a training mission you know, at Luke or Seymour Johnson or, or anywhere else uh, until the first bombs hit the ground. Uh, and there was no doubt at that point that they, they didn't know where we were, but they knew we were coming. And you can't prepare somebody for being shot at. I thought I had been prepared for that, but no, that's, it, was, uh, it was truly an eye-opening experience. A key element of our overall strategy was to knock down his interceptors uh, before they could interfere with our operations. The F-15Cs performed beautifully in that role. And uh, what it amounted to in the first three days of the war, when the control of the air was really contested by both sides, uh, the Iraqis would take off, they'd put their gear up, and they'd blow up. That's because the F-15 
with its look down, shoot down capability, was able to target them immediately after takeoff. Uh, I think that was fundamental to our success in the whole campaign. The F-15's mission is to intercept enemy aircraft and protect friendly aircraft. In the Gulf War, that meant guarding packages of planes, including F-16s, which flew bombing raids. F-4G wild weasels, which knocked out anti-aircraft guns and surface-to-air missiles. F-111 long-range fighter bombers, which flew over 4,000 sorties in the Gulf. British-built tornado fighter bombers and B-52s, the long-serving heavy bombers that shelled Iraq's Republican Guard around the clock every day of the war. Hundreds of coalition airplanes were in the sky at any one time. Airborne warning and control system airplanes, better known as AWACS, kept air traffic straight. Largely thanks to AWACS, there were no air-to-air -air friendly fire incidents during the Gulf War. With no symbology. When AWACS spotted enemy planes, they sent F-15s in for the kill. The 120 U.S. and 82 Saudi F-15s were responsible for 36 of the 41 confirmed air combat victories by coalition forces. The closest thing I saw to an enemy aircraft was the first day, and uh, that was in our package, the, the F-15s, got two MiG-29 kills. And I can remember it vividly, too, because we had uh, one of the female AWACS controllers. Her voice was very, uh, not soothing, but uh, her voice was easy to pick out when you hear a lot of radio chatter going on. A female voice to a guy, it's just it's something you hear. So we were, I was listening, and I can remember watching her talk, her talk uh, what the MiG-29s were doing on my radar. I just had it looking out there in the distance. And uh, when those guys turned and committed out on us, the Eagles were waiting on them and just jumped on them and shot them both down. Iraq's Air Force consisted of 750 fighters and bombers and 200 support planes. They flew the best non-U.S. planes money could buy, including Mirage F-1s and Soviet MiGs from the 29 on down. But despite having weathered 10 years of combat during the war with Iran, Iraq's Air Force was defeated in days. Planes that weren't shot out of the sky were blasted on the ground by F-111s and other fighter bombers. The Iraqis moved their planes into heavily reinforced aircraft hangars and bomb-proof revetments. The Allies countered by dropping hardened, laser-guided bombs. Eventually, they destroyed 375 of Iraq's 594 impregnable shelters. Tap it, tap it, tap it. Impact. Okay. By the ninth day of the war, Iraq's airfields were in ruins. The Iraqi Air Force apparently decided the only way to survive was to run. Flights of Iraqi fighters and bombers began streaking towards Iran. Some of the planes were shot down by F-15s. Some ran out of fuel. And about 150 made it to safety. You know, Iraq really had a good air force. Uh, it was well equipped, uh, MiG-29s, Mirages. It was well trained. I've met Iraqi pilots, and they're good. They, these guys are not slouches. Uh, they pulled off some fantastic missions in the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, the uh, strike against the uh, Iranian nuclear uh, power plants, the strike against uh, Karaj Islands they carry out, and, uh, but their problem, their weakness was, they were very centrally controlled, and they were tied to their ground control. So when the Iraqis took off, uh, many times they were blind because we took out the communications, we took out the radar sites, and then once we got them in the air, they were uh, more easily engaged and shot down. But the other thing is, because we made it look easy, don't think it was easy. Uh, those air-to-air -air engagements were a struggle, and uh, our guys risk it all, they pulled it off. Engagements were a struggle, and uh, our guys risk it all, but they pulled it off. Perhaps the greatest mistake made by coalition planners before the Gulf War began was underestimating the threat posed by Iraq's Scud ballistic missiles. Militarily, Scuds were insignificant. But politically, 
Scud attacks on Israel and Saudi Arabia could have torn the coalition apart. The political importance of hunting down the Scuds was so great that the best aircraft on hand was assigned to the task. That plane was the brand new F-15E fighter bomber. Though technically still in testing, F-15Es were rushed into combat when the Gulf War erupted. 48 were deployed to Saudi Arabia. The reason for this haste was that the E was simply too powerful a plane not to use. A dual role fighter, the F-15E has the air-to-air -air combat capability of the F-15C, plus the ability to fly night bombing missions in bad weather at altitudes as low as 200 feet, while carrying 24,500 pounds of ordnance. In keeping with the Eagle's no-expense-spared history, the F-15E is equipped with the finest weapon system available. The heart of the system is the same radar in every F-15, the APG-70. When used in the bombing role, this powerful radar gives pilots sharp views of the targets, no matter what the weather. F-15s were the only planes in the Gulf that carried fully functional lantern pods. The low-altitude navigation and targeting infrared for night system lets the Eagle fly across featureless terrain without navigation aids. It also contains a target tracker and a laser designator. The E's two crewmen have a bewildering array of instruments to monitor. The front seater flies the airplane and guards against air-to-air -air threats, while the weapons system operator in the back seat monitors four screens with up to 23 different displays. From very long distances, you can locate things on the ground that look just like a picture that you take from an overhead satellite. Near photograph capability. And you need very low squint angles to do that, so I don't necessarily have to be at uh, high altitude. Uh, I can be down at 300 or 500 feet and get uh, very much the same picture I would if I cruise over at 25,000. F-15Es worked closely with two planes carrying Grumman's brand new Joint Surveillance and Target Attack Radar System, known as J-STARS. J-STARS scans the ground day or night and in all weather conditions. It can detect and target virtually every object that falls in the path of its radar. Controllers relay this information down to ground commanders, who decide who and what will attack the targets. Unfortunately, on radar, a Scud carrier looks like any other large truck. Scud launchers were usually detected after they had fired a missile. What turned out to be different than we'd originally envisioned was the uh, need to go in and find mobile Scud targets, uh, and that wound up taking a lot of our time. I would guess that probably about 50 to 52 percent of the missions that we flew over there were done in western Iraq looking for mobile scuds and associated equipment. F-15Es patrolled the Iraqi border ready to attack scud sites. On the ground, British and American commandos went deep behind enemy lines looking for scuds and calling in airstrikes when they found them. But Iraq had over 1,200 scuds and the vast size of the region made finding them extremely difficult. Their very lack of sophistication made them easy to set up and fire, and their mobility made them easy to hide. We believe that uh, they adapted their tactics to the threat, which for them was the threat of being obliterated by a laser-guided bomb from an F-15E. Uh, they started to come out only at night. Uh, they started to take advantage of environmental conditions, which made it difficult for us to see them. Uh, and they began to uh, move their uh, operations areas farther north. The intense air attacks on Scud sites did seem to have an impact. In the first five days of the war, Iraq fired an average of five Scuds per day. In the month that followed, the average went down to one per day. Although Scud hunts became their priority, F-15E pilots were also sent against many other important, hard-to-hit targets, such as radar sites and airfields. During the Gulf War, the 48 F-15Es sent to Saudi Arabia flew over 2,200 sorties. They dropped more than 11 million pounds of bombs. By all accounts, the new airplane and its pilots performed superbly in combat. But flying 300 feet above the ground at night in heavily defended territory will always be extremely dangerous, no matter how good the pilot or how advanced the aircraft. Two F-15Es were lost in the first week of the war.
The F-15Es uh, had a tough job to do. They were flying at night, and they were the key to our scud hitting events over in western Iraq. Uh, unfortunately, we lost two of them during the war. One of them uh, will probably never know what happened. It could have been shot down, or it could have uh, flown into the ground. Uh, another one uh, was shot down probably by a surface-to-air missile over in western Iraq uh, while hunting scuds. I don't know of any military man that uh, really enjoys combat. It is something you learn to hate. You hate it because it's wasteful, because of the loss of life, and you actually feel a sense of immorality in the taking of life. Nonetheless, in this case, it had to be done. But uh, I lost friends over there. My former exec was one of the uh, guys that was lost in an F-15, and uh, I'll tell you, it hurts deeply. This is the F-117 Nighthawk, better known as the Stealth Fighter. Until recently, the sight of this plane at an air show would have been unthinkable. For years, the F-117 was one of the Air Force's most closely guarded secrets. But in 1991, this mysterious plane was the cornerstone of the strategic air campaign waged against Iraq. And literally overnight, the F-117 underwent a drastic change of image. Prior to January 16th, it was a symbol of wasteful defense spending. The day after, it represented the high-tech military juggernaut that crushed Iraq. F-117 is a product of Lockheed's Advanced Development Projects Group, which for decades has designed the most top secret planes in the Air Force inventory, including the SR-71 Blackbird. In many ways, the Blackbird was the first stealth aircraft, its sleek shape making it harder to spot on radar. Stealth technology was developed in response to the heavy losses the United States suffered in Vietnam from surface-to-air missiles and radar-guided guns. The development of radar-seeking missiles was one response to the threat. The other was a top-secret effort to create an aircraft that would be nearly impossible to detect by radar. If it could be built, such a plane would bring the element of surprise back to air warfare. The first known result of the program was Hav Blue, the predecessor of today's stealth fighter. Hav Blue remains classified to this day but it proved so stealthy that in 1978, Congress authorized production of an F-117 prototype, codenamed Senior Trend. By 1981, funds were allocated for an entire wing of F-117s, 59 planes in all. A new facility was built specifically to keep the highly classified project under wraps. The stealth base at Tonopah Test Range sits deep in the Nevada desert. Tonopah is so remote that pilots and crew are flown in for week-long stays. This secrecy was considered necessary because of the tension between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 1980s. The F-117 was a major leap forward in the evolution of fighter aircraft, and the Air Force knew it. Even the shape of the plane was kept secret for years. The secrecy was eased somewhat after December 1989, when the Nighthawk struck the first blow in Panama. Still, the only concrete details that emerged were about its cost 
$52 million per plane, $8.2 billion for the total program. Crashes during training caused skeptics to brand the plane the Wobbly Goblin. All the pilots who fly it really think that's a bogus rap. There was, uh, there was one that was crashed in testing uh, in the books called the Have Blue program when this was started. And we've lost two in, that were operational at tonight. And it was probably, no one really knows why they crashed. It was probably due to spatial disorientation back to it's a single seat, night airplane. It's easy to, you can lose your orientation, which way's up, which way's down, or be working on a task and the airplane will do something and you may not notice it and it could have gone out of control. It's all subjective, you know, it's all uh, speculation, no one knows. But the airplane is rock steady. I don't know if any airplane is as stable as this thing is. Uh, it's easy to fly, it's stable, and that name is totally bogus. The F-117 is a comparable airplane in size to the F-15, and as a matter of fact, we share a lot of the same components. The landing gear on the F-15 and this airplane are the same, same tires, a lot of the same subsystems, avionics systems, hydraulics, uh, and neutraulics, pneumatic type systems are all the same too. The cockpit is also about the same as an F-15. Very roomy, for a single seat fighter, it's spacious, plenty of room to lay out stuff that we carry with us. The nose is cut, and you won't see any perpendicular surfaces to go around. The four probes in the front are not machine guns, and they're not holographic projectors. They're called pitot tubes, air sensing tubes we use. We have a four-channel fly-by-wire flight control system. We have four pitot tubes. The grids in front replace normal intakes and are uh, put on there for radar cross-section reduction. Also, you'll notice all around the airplane where the canopies meet and when the weapons bay is opened and on the gear doors, you'll see sawtooth edges. That's also done to break up a radar signature. Anytime you have two edges that meet, you end up with a reflective edge. One of the things that you'll notice also, from the bottom, once the gear goes up, there's an elliptical shape to it. You'll notice how there, it's hard to see which way the airplane is. We call it aspect angle for other pilots, which way the airplane's approaching, your angle to it. And so it, as you see it, it can almost look like when the airplane's turning or straight and level, like it has a, a saucer type shape below because it's rounded. If you look at the uh, tail, you don't see any visible exhaust. The reason is that ledge or line that runs across here, there's a set of bricks that goes the full width of the tail. We take and spread the exhaust out across the width to cool it, right across these bricks, and then duct it up uh, so that there's no jet blast immediately behind the airplane. It's above. That gets rid of all of our infrared signature below. And if you imagine you're an air-to-air -air fighter trying to find us from above, you'll see that the tails slope out. If you go directly at 6 o'clock, the tail will cover the exhaust from right behind the airplane. Uh, we have to do maintenance on the airplane. We have to remove the ram portions to get to the panels. So, but the maintenance on the airplane is exactly like on any other airplane. As far as once you get under the skin, ugly is only skin deep or beauty is only skin deep, depending on how you want to look at it. Once you get under the skin, it's a, a standard Air Force type airplane. The F-117 skin of radar absorbent material, or RAM, absorbs whatever lingering radar energy that hasn't been deflected by the Nighthawk's faceted surfaces. This turret contains the F-117's forward-looking infrared sensor, part of its highly classified navigation and attack system. Under the fuselage sits a downward-looking infrared sensor. Both the FLIR and BELIR are equipped with lasers that spotlight targets for laser-guided precision weapons. And precision is a must since the Nighthawk can only carry two 2,000-pound bombs. The bombs must be carried internally to keep the plane's radar cross-section stealthy. When not flying combat missions, pilots carry their belongings in personal effects pods that ride in the bomb bay. Until the Gulf War began, even those familiar with the F-117 weren't completely certain that stealth would work against a sophisticated air defense system. But the coalition's air command was gambling that stealth would work as advertised. They planned to send F-117s alone into Baghdad, the most heavily defended city in Iraq. January 17th, 1991, 3 a.m. Saudi time. January 17th, 1991, 3 a.m. Saudi time. Two squadrons of F-117 Nighthawks launch simultaneous strikes across the city of Baghdad, dropping approximately 60 laser-guided bombs on Iraqi communications buildings, 
air defense bunkers, ammunition bunkers, Scud missile sites, and the headquarters of the Iraqi Air Force. Within minutes, the foundation of Iraq's complex command and control network has been crippled, and the war in the Persian Gulf has begun. It is a mission Nighthawk pilots have anticipated for months. We got notified and we're on a, uh, a little bit of an emotional roller coaster for a couple of weeks till we actually went. But we deployed through Langley Air Force Base. Uh, and then from there, we made a uh, one hop about 15 and a half hours to a place called Kamis Mashad in Saudi Arabia, southern part, uh, almost uh, just, oh, maybe 100 miles north of Yemen. F 117s from the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, 42 in all were sent to a Saudi base far from a rocky missile range. But their great distance from Baghdad would require them to fly 2,000 miles round trip every mission. On the plus side, Kamis Mushat was a state-of-the-art air base. When we were arrived at Saudi Arabia, we weren't sure what type of facilities we'd have. As a matter of fact, at one point, we weren't even sure which base we were going to once we were airborne. But the facilities we were put into were absolutely superb. The Saudis were excellent hosts and gave us a, a brand new facility they had built and hadn't even accepted from the contractor. So when we got there, they were still turning on the water, finding beds, and they still had, uh, had to break the seals and all the, the pipes and doors for us to get in. So it was a, actually one of the better facilities. It's as good as we had at Tonopah as far as war protection, bunkers. And, uh, but the Saudis, again, were this super. They gave us everything that we requested plus some. The Saudis called the F-117 Shaba, or Ghost. The pilots, crews, and the generals who sent them into battle could only hope the plane would fit that description. The quick victory in the Gulf has led to the misconception that Iraq was a poorly defended opponent that put up little resistance to its attackers. In fact, Iraq was equipped with an interneted radar system and armed with 16,000 surface-to-air missiles and 7,000 anti-aircraft guns. When the air war started, I sat there in the tactical air control center, and uh, I was feeling very badly. First of all, we were embarking on the taking of lives, and uh, that's tough. Uh, I didn't know whether the technology would work. I was told the test data showed stealth worked, but I had no way of knowing it had never been tested in such numbers, and that was a worry. Fortunately, it turned out great. But I think uh, the thing that bothers you the most is when you sit there, is you wonder of all the things you may not have done, the, uh, the things the enemy could do to you that you hadn't anticipated. And so as this battle unfolded, we felt great relief. I had the honor of leading the, the first attack on Baghdad. Uh, there were uh, 10 of us that uh, went downtown uh, before the rest of the uh, support package uh, came in. Uh, and I have to tell you that, uh, that uh, Baghdad was the damnedest fireworks show that, I, that I'd ever seen. And the city was, was lit up like it was a, a holiday, just in terms of all the street lights and traffic out there, even though it was still 3 or 4 in the morning. But then you take the city that is all lit up, and you accent it first with, with, with arcs of 23 millimeter that are uh, very high rate of fire weapons and shooting almost uh, horizontally. You could look down and see all that. And then about the level that we were flying, uh, there were red-orange bursts of, of uh, larger caliber flak going off, and it, it was from one end of the city to the other, just, just completely uh, like a cloud layer sitting over it, only so active. And then uh, to kind of accent that whole fireworks light display, there'd be three ships of, of uh, SAM missiles coming right up through uh, that whole mess uh, and explode overhead. Despite the ground fire, the F-117s performed the mission they were designed for, covert surgical strikes against hardened, high-value, heavily defended targets. Flying at night, F-117s dropped 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs from 25,000 feet and hit targets the size of shoeboxes. Apparently, the Iraqi army never saw them coming. But on the first night, flying in radio silence, pilots had no way of knowing just how successful their attacks had been. 
had a long way to go to uh, find the tanker again and uh, <laughs> found him and uh, got my wingman on and uh, we talked on the way back and asked hey did you hear from so and so or did you hear uh, you know this other guy check in and, and we said no and, and uh, so I thought we'd lost a couple airplanes the first night and uh, it was a long trip home believe me coming back here when I landed uh, the crew chiefs told me that, that everybody had uh, returned, that all the F-117s had come back, and I didn't believe them because I, I, just, I just couldn't believe that anybody would have survived through all that AAA. Uh, but sure enough, uh, after he told me about the third time and, and other people nodded their heads and said, yeah, everybody made it back and went, gosh, that's, uh, that was more of a relief than anything. I went up on the second night. Uh, the first night, I think the guys had a cakewalk because no one knew they were coming until they got there. The second night, they knew that we were coming. When people throw bullets up into the air and you're going through there, it's just a, a function of uh, how fast you're going through and how many bullets are up there if you're going to get hit or not. We were very fortunate, but we also were uh, a little bit skillful in that, too, that no stealths throughout the entire war going to Baghdad almost every night sustained any hits at all. There's no doubt about it that uh, the stealth technology has revolutionized air operations and warfare in total. Uh, the 117 guys were the ones that flew the tough missions downtown in Baghdad, one of the most heavily defended targets in the world. The fact that they were able to go in there without escort, without defense suppression, meant that we did not have to attack hundreds of targets located in residential areas and kept down overall casualties, overall loss of life, and a lot of collateral damage. Well, I'm not going to tell you that it wasn't exciting going through Baghdad, but it's not an excitement that I want to go back and relive in the near future, or if ever. Uh, I think that most of the guys will tell you that, uh, I think I feel the way they do, is that we're doing our job over there, and the excitement that comes from that is mostly about getting the job done. It's real exciting when you figure out people are trying to kill you, but at the time they're trying to do it, you're too busy doing other things. Uh, we're fully occupied when we're doing a target run, and so you don't have time to sightsee usually. Uh, it's, when it's all of them, you're through with your run, you're on your way out, you have a chance to look back and see what was there, and that's when you kind of go, well, you know, thank you, Lord, for another one. Kamis Mushat. General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, commander of Allied forces in the Gulf, has come to inspect the airplane that has been the key factor in destroying Iraq's defense and communications network. F-117 bombing runs were instrumental in driving Iraq's military leadership into underground bunkers and cutting them off from their troops. Strikes on electrical power plants and oil reserves across the nation rendered much of the Iraqi army's high-tech equipment all but useless. In strike after strike, the F-117 was proving its destructive potential. I think it's fair to say that the Iraqi command and control in its totality was decimated by the F-117. And I'm sure there are those who, who attacked targets that were on the fringe, but the main focus of his command and control were attacked solely by the 117s and they were attacked in many cases in an autonomous mode. One 117, one bomb, and nobody else around. Although it's called the stealth fighter, to date the F-117 has flown in combat exclusively as a light bomber. The F-117 carries laser-guided bombs, which are actually conventional 2,000-pound bombs fitted with special noses that steer towards targets marked by laser beams. Laser-guided bombs are very accurate, but they are also very expensive. Most of the bombs dropped during the Gulf War were unguided gravity bombs. But for targets in urban areas, the coalition opted for precision weapons. And for true precision, those bombs were dropped by F-117s. The accuracy of the Nighthawks was such that although they flew only 2% of total combat sorties in the Gulf, they covered 40% of all strategic targets. F-117s dropped over 2,000 tons of bombs and flew more than 6,900 combat hours. The Air Force is fond of pointing out that a target that would have taken more than 500 missions to destroy in World War II 
can now be vaporized in one mission with one bomb. And since stealth planes can fly into enemy territory without fighter escorts, jamming planes, or other support aircraft, fewer pilots' lives are on the line. Well, it saves lives, but the analogies, the numbers sometimes will lie to you. You'll see it, uh, figures thrown around that we're equivalent of 200 to 300 B-17s. Well, that's true in one perspective, because we can go places they can't go and knock out with one bomb what will take them thousands of bombs to hit. Because, it's, again, it's back to the shotgun effect versus being able to walk up to the same guy. If you're trying to kill somebody with a shotgun and you pelt him at 200 yards, you're only going to make him mad. If you can sneak up and he doesn't see, you can hit him between the eyes with a ball-peen hammer. It's a lot more cost-effective. But even precision weapons can result in the loss of innocent lives. In one well-publicized incident, an F-117 dropped laser-guided bombs on a target identified as an Iraqi communication center. The bombs hit their target and the bunker was destroyed. Unfortunately, what served as a communication center by day doubled as a civilian air raid shelter by night. The bombs went exactly where they were aimed, but the target itself, apparently chosen from analysis of daylight satellite intelligence, was hit at the wrong time. Still, even Iraq concedes its civilian casualties were relatively light. In World War II, whole cities were targeted for destruction. Stealth gave the Allies the opportunity to change the emphasis of air war away from genocide and back to strategy. My profession right now is a violent profession, but if you look back at this campaign, uh, Desert Storm, and look at the small number of fatalities and what we were able to do with stealth airplanes and with a lot of very, very smart planning uh, and compare it to what the other contingencies, what could have happened, uh, this airplane did save a lot of lives. It may have saved tens of thousands or maybe even millions of lives by going in and knocking out things that would have taken years to knock out otherwise in a, a classic air campaign. Um, it saved my life, you know, for one, to start with, because I could not have gone where I did and I would have died if I'd been a regular airplane. In late 1991, despite massive defense budget cuts, Congress ordered that production should begin on a dozen new F-117 Nighthawks. During the Gulf War, the F-15E and the F-117 Nighthawk received a great deal of publicity for their performance as deep interdiction bombers. Much was made of their high-tech systems, their ability to drop precision bombs, and their prowess as all-weather night fighters. But 84 much older, less heralded planes flew more than 4,000 sorties in the Gulf, largely at night, in bad weather, carrying heavy loads of laser-guided bombs. These were the F-111F Aardvarks. Designed by General Dynamics, the F-111 entered Air Force service in 1967. It was designed to carry virtually any bomb in the service's inventory, including nuclear weapons. tested in combat during the last years of the Vietnam War. Later, it was kept at NATO bases, ready to fly in the event of a Soviet attack on Europe. In 1986, F-111s mounted a precision strike against Libya. Now, and engage the 
In test after test, the F-111 proved its ability to fly very low, very fast, even in bad weather at night, and still hit its targets. The EF-111 jamming plane served alongside the F-111 bomber during the Gulf War. Together, they're a deadly combination. The F-111 was the stalwart of the strategic air campaign. Behind the F-117, which can do things that an F-111 can't do just because uh, it can go places and not be shot, places the F-111 can't go because of its larger radar cross-section makes it easier for the enemy to acquire it and shoot it. However, uh, F-111s travel in packs. They each carry four laser-guided bombs. That's 16 precision aim points per formation. So if you sent F-111s to a bridge, the bridge was going down. Whereas with other precision-guided weapons platforms, which only carry two bombs and travel by themselves, the bridge might end up with uh, a single hole in it. The impact. Boom! The F-111F's Pave Tack Pod lets the plane illuminate its targets with a laser beam. Paveway laser-guided bombs then follow the signal down to the ground. Strikes are accurate within a few feet. F-111s aren't thought of as being tank killers, but in the Gulf, the plane was very effectively used against armor. F-111s cruised over Iraqi lines using their FLIR pods to sweep search back and forth across the ground looking for targets. When they spotted tanks, they designated their targets with the PAVTAX laser, then dropped 500-pound GBU-12 laser-guided bombs. In the week before the ground campaign began, F-111s killed up to 150 tanks per night. Overall, they had over 1,000 verified kills of Iraqi armor. Well, it's fair to say that they carried a large load of the bomb. Um, they were very effective. We flew them basically uh, at night and uh, almost predominantly. As you know, we've talked about the tank plinking, so to speak. No one thought beforehand that they could do that mission, but they proved they could very effectively. Uh, they certainly were the main airplane that we used to attack airfield hardened aircraft shelters. Uh, we used the 111s uh, systematically to uh, destroy as many airplanes on the ground in those shelters as, as we could. Impact. Impact. Real pretty down there. The only exception to that is there were certain high threat areas that we would only put the 117 in across those airfields because of the potential for loss. Now that does not mean that the 111s didn't go into some high threat areas. Um, they attacked some of the airfields uh, within 20 miles of Baghdad. And uh, so those were high threat areas. Boom! Oh, yes! They did a lot of the bridges, uh, tremendous amount of the bridges. Uh, they cut off the uh, oil that was uh, right, one, three, five, intentionally uh, flowing into the uh, the uh, uh, water there just uh, south of Kuwait City. Um, 
And so true, they carried a load, uh, a very heavy load in the war. And to be as old an airplane as they were, I mean, that pleasantly uh, surprised us in that respect, uh, that we were able to maintain that many s missions on a daily basis from that older system. I guess the bottom line for that is it's a flexible, long-range, uh, precision platform uh, that found uh, itself used in roles uh, uh, for which uh, we didn't have any established doctrine. Uh, I, I flew the uh, F-111F at one time and have dropped PAVTAC weapons, and I can tell you that the sorts of missions that they flew in this war were not the sorts of missions that we were trained to fly. They flew medium altitude, for example, when all, just about all of our practice is low altitude. They flew against targets that were within 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles of the forward line of own troops. Uh, when they practice uh, dropping on bridges and factories and airfields hundreds of miles away from friendly troops. Uh, it goes to show you that airplanes don't, shouldn't be designed to go to particular places, but uh, however, uh, I don't know how to explain this, but there are no strategic or tactical airplanes. There are just missions and then best instruments to be used for those various missions. And the F-111 turned out to be a very flexible instrument that could be used for strategic attack against targets at the heart of the enemy uh, military offensive capability, or it could be used as a, a, a tank plinker to destroy an estimated 1,000 uh, tanks in the Kuwait theater of operations. A very formidable weapon system used to great effect during the war.